All right. Well, hello again, folks. This is Dr. David, and welcome to tonight's webinar, which is, I tell you, a very, very, I believe, going to be a very, very interesting one. And no pressure, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> sure thing. Uh, in all our webinars, whenever we're looking out for speakers, whenever we're trying to get a topic covered, we want we 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 look out primarily for these four factors. We want to see. We look to see, we look to see how well these four factors will be covered. The number one, which of course is the most important, how the body works. Number two, what the body needs. And number three, of course, toxins, threats to our health. And number four, working intelligently with your healthcare professional. Because in the final analysis, if you don't understand what you, how your body works, you really won't understand how the other three will fit in. And so that's, that's why ex when we hear about a field like acupuncture, which is growing, exploding in this country, for instance, we want to know why it works <laughs> and, 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 and just really what is the, the, the theory and the philosophy behind this, uh, and of course, the science behind uh, this, 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 this practice. And so I'm very, very grateful to have uh, Robert on to come ex help explain that. I'm sure people will get a better understanding of how their bodies and minds work after this presentation. And of course, we'll know what the place acupuncture, uh, what acupuncture has to offer you. And so without much further ado, I'm going to ask Sherry to do the introduction. Okay. Robert Lowe, LAC, holds a bachelor's in psychology from Texas A&M and a master's in oriental medicine from Northwestern Health Sciences University. He is, a he is licensed by the state of Minnesota and board certified by the NCCAOM. His clinical experience includes neurological rehabilitation, chemical dependency treatment, and integrative health care. He is currently the ac acupuncturist at Affinity Med Medical Group in New Hope, Minnesota. So again, I'll echo what David said, Robert, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. I think David's handing screen control over to you right now. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, well, thank you guys very much. I'd like to thank um, both Dr. David and Sherry um, and Building Strength uh, webinars for giving me this opportunity to share um, a type of medicine that I just kind of stumbled upon, but is just truly amazing. Um, also, really quick, I'd like to thank Mary Ann Cooper. Um, she's the person who introduced me to you guys in the first place. And so if she's listening out there, thank you very much, Mary Ann. Um, now, just really quick to kind of tie it in with what Building Strength Webinars is uh, about in the first place. Um, one of my professors um, just kind of pounded it into our head that acupuncture is only effective if you treat the mind the body, the spirit, and the community. And what he was talking about with the community is the social situation that the person is in, their um, social structure. Um, and that's something that I've taken to heart and um, truly believe that all medicine needs to um, kind of focus on those four things in order to bring about um, true healing. Um, now, this presentation uh, is intended to just kind of give a, a foundation for people going out there and looking to, um, you know, start care with an acupuncturist. I'm going to briefly talk about um, you know, what to look for in an acupuncturist, what types of training is out there. Um, very briefly go into the, the Chinese medical theory. Um, it confuses a lot of people. It took me three years of school to just start um, to understand exactly what this is all about. And so I'm not going to try to bog you guys down with too much of that. Um, and I'm going to go on and talk about just some of the, um, the Western medicine um, that, or I guess, some of the, the Western re research um, and foundations for how this is working, and then talk about what I would do as an acupuncturist, as well as um, some of the things that acupuncture is successful at treating. So to start off, I think, let's see. Here we go. If, you, if you're oh. having trouble, sometimes you might just need to you, you right click. And, uh, and I, next. I think I just got it. Are you guys able to see that? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, just talking about um, the education. What somebody in, uh, who practices acupuncture needs to kind of go through to get the skills necessary to perform this type of medicine effectively and safely. Um, education's a, a big factor, as you know, I explained to you. I um, 
was in school for three years uh, to get my master's degree just in oriental medicine. Um, there are also are um, people who perform acupuncture, uh, medical doctors, um, chiropractors. Um, these guys have also gone to lots of school, as you guys well know. Um, then beyond that, um, they need to be licensed by the state. And again, this is something that acupuncture is still kind of in its infancy. There are states out there that don't have a license um, system in place. So, for example, in South Dakota, um, anyone can hang up a shingle and say, I'm an acupuncturist. They don't necessarily have the education or the training. Um, and so that's just something else for people to be aware of, that you want them licensed in the state. Um, that's actually what the LAC is behind my name. Um, it stands for licensed acupuncturist, and that is something that the state issues. Um, also, it's important for the acupuncturist to be board certified. Um, I'm board certified by the NCCAOM, um, which is the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. Um, it's a national board certification that requires a series of um, uh, four tests to uh, determine that you have the, the knowledge base to be able to practice this. Um, one of the weird caveats right now, um, at least I feel it's kind of weird, um, is California is a state that um, does not recognize the NCCAOM uh, certification. Um, they, in fact, do it um, themselves. And in a lot of ways, it's more rigorous than what the NCCAOM requires. In fact, at this point in time with the education I have, um, I could not practice in California even if I passed the boards because I don't meet their educational requirements for what they, they need. Um, also, if you're a medical doctor, um, you can have the, uh, you can be certified or, you know, get your credentials through the American Board of Medical Acupuncture. Um, and then finally, the American Chiropract Chiropractic Association also has um, certification process for chiropractors who perform acupuncture. Now, within um, kind of the acupuncture community, there is some debate and some contention about whether or not medical doctors and uh, chiropractors should be allowed to do acupuncture. I personally feel that it's an excellent opportunity to introduce more people to acupuncture, um, and they do a very good job of treating um, a very specialized list of, of conditions, primarily in pain and uh, rehabilitation. Um, as you can see based on this slide, or on this slide, um, Everyone has additional training in acupuncture. Uh, medical doctors to um, get their certification need to go through 200 hours of classroom training and 100 hours of clinical training. Uh, chiropractors, it's um, 100 hours total, and that's split between um, the classroom and uh, the clinic. Now, these um, modules are set up, again, to treat a very specific set of um, conditions. They don't go into the internal medicine in the same way that, that I do or that other um, acupuncturists who are specifically trained in acupuncture and oriental medicine have. Um, let's see. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind and to just know that if you go and see someone who has a master's in oriental medicine or a master's in acupuncture, they do have considerably more training, uh, 850 hours just in classroom time, another 700 plus hours of um, seeing patients. Um, in addition, a lot of acupuncturists out there are also trained in herbal medicine. Now this is specifically for um, Chinese um, herbal formulas or Japanese herbal formulas. Um, and I hate to say it, but a lot of times people will come in with questions about um, this supplement or that or you know, wanting to do a detox. And that's outside of my area of expertise. Um, I know uh, some about that, um, but you're better off talking to a chiropractor, a, a homeopathy practitioner, um, someone who has more knowledge about that. I'm very specialized in just the herbal medicine. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what the separation is. Um, by all means, go in and see your chiropractor and ask about acupuncture um, because it's you know, a wonderful uh, bridge into the world of what I can treat um, with my um, education. Now another big thing to look for um, when you are you know, trying to find an acupuncturist that's out there um, is how they are using the needles or how they're, they're working with the needles. Um, the FDA is very clear about the needles need to be sterile, they need to be one-time use needles, and um, guide tubes are kind of that gray area. And I'll go through those one at a time. The sterile just means that they have to be sterilized in some uh, manner or another. Um, the needles I use, I'll, I'll use, I believe it's ethylene oxide to sterilize them, and then they're sealed in a, a package and only opened once they're about to be used. Um, the one-time use 
refers to a couple of things. One, um, it's not a good idea to see an acupuncturist that has one set of needles that's autoclaving it every night. Um, it, there's People have run into problems in the past with that. Um, and so we want these needles to be, you open them out of the package, um, you insert them, once the treatment's done, you remove them and dispose of them, and they are never used again. Another big thing for the one-time use is reinsertion. Um, there are some people out there that will um, insert a needle into one point and then decide to change that point so they'll pull the needle out or they didn't uh, you know, get the effect they wanted so they move the needle. Um, again, that's a big no-no. It, it um, has the potential for introducing infection and just is not the best practice. Um, and then finally, regarding the guide tube, um, there are a lot of acupuncturists out there that will um, not use guide tubes. It's called freehanding. So basically, the, the picture that you can see down there is kind of a modified form of it, where they'll actually touch the shaft of the needle. You can see that they're touching the part that um, could enter the body. Um, this has been the practice in China and other um, you know, countries that uh, do acupuncture and where a lot of our instructors come from. And so that just gets passed on um, down the road. It just it isn't the best practice, and it's not um, it it's goes against FDA guidelines and regulations because you're touching something that should be sterile entering the body um, with your hand, which by definition can never be sterilized. Um, so again, these are things that you want to look for um, if you are seeing an acupuncturist, and just ask you know are you using a guide tube? Um, you know are your needles sterile one time use? And I'm very glad to say that um, these problems are becoming less and less as time goes on. Um, I was fortunate through my education to see how the, the types of students entering are you know, coming in from more, I guess, of a, a medical background, even though their uh, background is still very diverse, but they understand the, the medical side and the, the reality that we live in this day and age with um, infectious disease. So, that being said, that's kind of my, um, you know, what do you look for in a, an acupuncturist and make sure that you're safe um, in being a good consumer of, of this medicine. Um, now, going into, I guess, the history and where acupuncturists come from. Um, we're not really sure when acupuncture actually started. Um, it's tough to trace back um, the uh, origin of this, and it's been a medicine that's been evolving for thousands of years. Um, from what my understanding of the history is, is that it literally started with shamanism. The same type of shamanism that you'd find in the Amazon rainforest um, or, you know, in other parts of the world, actually instead of, you know, kind of dying out and, and changing like it did in so many of those locations, transformed and turned into what we know now as modern acupuncture. Um, China also went through three major religious, um, I guess, movements. And by no means am I an expert on um, the religion of China or any of these that are listed up there, the Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. Um, but it does play a role in how acupuncture was developed in the theories. The, the Taoism um, relates or concerns how man relates or humans relate to the natural environment. And because of that, you'll see or hear a lot of diagnoses such as wind heat. Um, you know, you're, they're talking about the, the natural, um, you know, what they have, have observed with wind. It can, um, you know, it kind of hits you on the back of the neck, um, those sort of things, where they, they've observed these things in nature and then applied that framework to medicine. Um, for Confucianism and Buddhism, Confucianism um, kind of relates how, or is how humans relate to society, and Buddhism is how, um, and again, sorry if I'm butchering it. If any of you guys out there understand these religions better than I do, um, please don't just hang up because you know I'm doing such a bad job in butchering these. But Buddhism is how the individual relates to him or herself. Um, once acupuncture kind of progressed from the shamanism to the Taoism, um, it kind of got flavors of the Confucianism and Buddhism, which shaped, again, how it's evolved into um, what it is today. Now, one of the things that I'm going to touch on later on um, is the scientific research regarding acupuncture. And to be honest with you, it's difficult. Um, at least it was difficult for me to kind of come to, come to terms with it. My background um, was primarily in Western medicine. And so I'm the you know big, I need a, a double-blind, placebo-controlled study in order to prove that this is effective. 
And one of the ways that I um, kind of came to terms with this is that acupuncture has um, essentially been um, running a, a clinical trial for the last 4,000 years. You know, they, these doctors um, have been changing and modifying their views and how this is performed to, um, to follow along with the results that they're getting in clinic. Um, so I, I kind of, I guess, to get around that, understand that, act, get around the, the lack of research out there, is to just understand that it works. Um, it's not necessarily important to know ex absolutely how it works, but the fact that the end results are there. Um, and now as we're um, kind of moving into the modern medicine age, um, we've started to see uh, many instances in which acupuncture um, is integrated into modern or uh, Western, medic, uh, Western medicine with great results, showing again that um, there are many, many approaches to healing, and if you, you know, focus on just one, yeah, you're going to get better. But it's taking into account all of these that you know is absolutely key. Um, in fact, most of my um, professors in school had both a Western medical as well as a um, Oriental medical training. Um, one of again, one of my great professors um, was an orthopedic surgeon in China, but also a world-renowned acupuncturist. So where we're at right now um, is there's several different styles. In fact, I would be willing to argue that there's as many styles of acupuncture and oriental medicine as there are um, practitioners out there. It takes on a very individual flavor for each person. Um, the type or the style that I'm trained in is called traditional Chinese medicine. Um, there's also Japanese um, acupuncture and, and herbs. Um, there's five element, which is primarily a Western um, style. And then even within that, there's several microsystems. Um, the differences between these styles, um, for example, traditional Chinese medicine versus Japanese style, um, is very slight. You know, we're still using the same theoretical basis. We're still um, diagnosing people in much the same way. It's just the, the style or the, the way that we apply the needles. Um, for example, traditional Chinese medicine uses major points along the meridians whereas the Japanese medicine will use something called assure points, which is basically the, uh, the translation is, ah, that's it. These are points that um, the practitioner will sense or press on and know that you know, that's the exact precise place that they're going to put the needle um, and then do a very uh, shallow light insertion. Um, five element, um, again, uses some of the elements from both the traditional Chinese and the Japanese but it looks at the five basic elements, um, the metal, water, earth, fire, and wow, I'm just drawing a complete blank here, guys. I again apologize if any of my professors are listening because I just did them a great disservice. Um, let's see. <laughs> Is that uh, air? You mean air? What was that? Is it air? No, it, it's not air. It, it, it's similar to the, like the Greek um, elements, but it, it's different. It's... Um, I'll get this. Uh, earth, um, fire, wind. water, not wind. Oh, this is not good. No. Sad thing is I also know all the Chinese symbols for these, too. Okay, earth, fire, um, metal, water, and um, shoot, earth, fire. I wrote earth twice. Okay, let's move on from this because this is just embarrassing. Um, <laughs> anyway, it, it takes into account five elements. Each of these elements are associated with an organ system, um, and when those organ systems are in disharmony, that um, results in a pathology, and then they treat balancing one element to the next. Um, as far as microsystems go, these are ones are uh, styles that have kind of developed um, recently over time. Um, or in recent uh, time, uh, auricular uses just the ear. Um, it kind of, if you can imagine a picture of the ear flipped upside down, it very much resembles a fetus. Um, we use the points kind of with that fetus map on there. So you know, the, the lobe of the ear is going to treat a lot of conditions related to the head. The inside of the ear is more uh, internal, and then you have the limbs kind of wrapping around the, the outside of the ear. Um, what I find fascinating about auricular is a couple things. One, um, the vagus nerve um, 
the only place the vagus nerve comes to the surface of the body um, that's easily accessible um, is in that inner part of the ear. And the vagus nerve is what you know primarily controls the internal organs. Um, also, you go back through history before this um, type of um, acupuncture was even thought of, and you find anecdotal stories of like sailors in the, the Mediterranean swearing that their eyesight improves um, when they pierce their ear at a certain point. It just happens to be that that point is the same point that we use for eyesight. Um, another microsystem is uh, hand acupuncture, um, specifically Korean hand acupuncture. Um, and if you can imagine your hand on the table with your middle finger being your head um, and your neck, and then your index and ring finger would be your arms, and your pinky and thumb would be your legs. And each joint on your um, fingers corresponds to a joint um, within your body. So that um, very um, last joint on your index finger would be the equivalent of your wrist, and so on from there. From that, they're able to treat um, pretty much any condition in the body, but it primarily works for pain. Um, and then scalp acupuncture is a, another wonderful uh, microsystem. In fact, I'm using it right now on a patient um, to treat Parkinson's. Um, and it was developed by, a, I believe, a neurologist in China who was forced by the government to go out and just practice acupuncture, you know, kind of with the, the working people because of, you know, during that time of, of political unrest. And he started implementing or uh, integrating, I should say, some of what he knew about neurology along with um, the classic acupuncture tests and finding the connections there and able to develop a system that, again, I'll go into this in a little bit with some of the other, you know, the applications of acupuncture, but developed a system that has profound effects on uh, neurological conditions. Um, Robert? Yes. We, we have had two people type in wood. Would that be the, 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 the one you're looking for? Yes, thank you guys so very much. I truly appreciate that, wood. Yep. Okay. That is exactly what it is. Thanks, guys. All right. I, I'm, I'm a little interested in that uh, uh, Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. Now, now he, my first question is, is you can actually treat conditions. Uh, so um, it, the FDA does allow you to use the word treat to treat uh, in, your, in, in your lexicon. I believe so, yes. One of the areas acupuncture education is lacking is in both the business and the legal side of things. And in fact, this was a discussion I had with my boss earlier um, regarding um, the verbiage used for um, advertisements or for promotions. So if anyone from the FDA is listening and I'm incorrect, I apologize. Um, but just in layman's terms, yes, treat is what I use to, to describe what I'm doing. Okay, great. And I am very interested in what you just said about Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you going to cover some more on that? I mean, uh, uh, what, what nerves are we looking at um, that you address in, in Parkinson's disease, for instance? Yep, I, I actually will address a little later um, some of the work I did with neurological rehabilitation. And okay, that's great. definitely covered in there. Um, and, okay, great. Yeah. Great. So getting... Um, getting, I guess, into the, the theory. And again, this is a very basic theory. I'm not going to throw around terms like qi or yin and yang or, you know, um, some of the other, I guess, more technical terms that we have. I just want you guys to get a, a good understanding of what the concept of uh, disease is within Chinese medicine, or I should say within um, oriental medicine. So as you go through life, you're going to experience um, these over here, the trauma, stress, um, choices that we make for lifestyle, um, emotions that we experience, and then pathogens, you know, colds and flus, other th uh, external things that come in from the outside. And this can also include toxins, um, pretty much anything that um, is invading your body. Now, when this happens, your body gets out of balance. Your body um, is absolutely amazing, and that doesn't even begin to describe it. Um, a good analogy is getting a cut. Last time you know, we got a cut, any of us, that cut didn't hang around. It, it didn't stay. It essentially healed itself um, rather quickly, too. Um, same thing with, say, colds and flus. Um, our body wants to be in a state of balance so that it naturally heals itself. Unfortunately, the external, these outside things, come in and they make it so our body is not balanced. 
if that imbalance is not corrected and not changed, your body can't heal itself and that progresses into disease, what we understand as disease, um, the, the symptomatic side of, of things. Um, what acupuncture does is it interrupts that cycle. So we still have uh, you know, physical and emotional trauma, we still have stress, we still have lifestyle choices that we make and all these outside things coming in, but that cycle is interrupted when you can correct that balance, your body is allowed to heal itself, there's no disease that's there and next time those things come in, uh, to play in your life, your body is able to handle them better and if it's not able to handle it, you know, that's again when acupuncture comes in and can continue to improve that. Um, it's not a one treatment process either. You know, a lot of people, not a lot, but some people get frustrated and it's like, well, you can't just take care of this in one treatment. And my response to that is, when was the last time you went to the doctor for, call, uh, say, high blood pressure medication and only took one pill? It's very much the same thing. It, it's a, a process. Um, you in the first treatment, the person's going to walk away and feel great, they're going to be balanced, and then slowly that balance is going to go back to where it was, or the imbalance is going to return. Um, and it's through uh, repeated treatments that you're able to strengthen the body. You go through a, a phase where you are just providing relief care, and then you go into corrective care, strengthening the body, and then a maintenance phase where you know you're coming back in once a month, once every six months, basically just to say hi and, and make sure that everything's okay. Um, and so that in a nutshell is what acupuncture is doing. Um, and also for that matter the Chinese herbs, or I'm sorry, the, the herbs in general, um, and then the other techniques that I'm doing. Um, all of these are just designed to restore the body to a state of balance so it can heal itself. In fact, I don't heal people, I give their body or remind their body how to do the work. Um, so this is the part where I will talk a little bit about chi. Um, our bodies are a network of um, energy cycling through. A lot of people kind of equate this to the nervous system or um, to the circulatory system and it's much the same way. Um, there are very defined channels in which this energy is moving through your body um, and not only on the outside like you can see in the picture here, um, but each one of these channels connects to the internal organs. Um, this is why an acupuncture point um, down here on your leg can actually treat digestive problems. Um, one way to think of this is these 12 meridians, um, and there are extra meridians beyond this, but just the basic 12 are a lot like rivers with the, the good flow going through there. Um, rivers can go through floods, they can go through droughts, um, they can get dammed up. Um, and any time one of these things happen to a river, everything around the river, everything that that river flows through is damaged and um, you know needs some help. If it sits like that too, for too long, the damage is going to be irreversible or much harder to repair. Now along these channels there's um, I believe 365 defined points and there's many many more especially when you take into account the microsystems. But these major points are kind of like the, the dams. The, um, uh, the control mechanism for how we release energy or hold energy back to end up balancing the meridians. And this is in a nutshell what the needle insertion is doing. Um, when somebody comes up and says, I'm having you know, problems with my stomach, depending on how you know, the, the underlying cause for that digestive problem, um, I will select a point and either add more, well, that's not the right term either tonify that point or I'll sedate the point. In other words, add more to it or, or subtract from it in order to change that flow through the entire river. Um, does that make sense to you, Dr. David? I'm going to kind of use you as the a sounding board for this. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. I'm still trying to get, I'm still taking it in. This is interesting. Okay. How, <laughs> how something in the knee can affect the, the, yes. the intestine. That's, that's new to me. Yeah, it's um, again one of those things where it, I had to at first take it on faith and then just seeing it work over and over again has proven to me that it, it you don't have to necessarily understand why something in the knee is going to affect the stomach, but it does work. Um, and the theoretical basis is just that that same point that's in the knee, it would be, um, or just below the knee, the stomach channel, um, which is 
right out here where the, the cursor is not only travels along this path that you can see, but also diverts to internal organs. So a lot of people will say, well, I have pain in you know, my um, calf. I'll do a, a point along the, the channel where that pain is to change the flow just in, in that specific area, but that flow has changed so much further up the river that it can affect the, or affect the internal organs as well. And 365 points, how do they come up with that number? Is, that's, is, is it, it just a coincidence? Those are the, the codified points. The, the, right now they're, they're working on a way to kind of bring this and have anyone understand it um, across the world. Um, a lot of the, the points, I'm going to go back here, a lot of the points are named with Chinese names or Japanese names. Okay. Um, so like again, that point on your leg for digestion, the English translation is three mile leg. Um, I know it as stomach 36 and it's been codified as far as it is a certain distance below, a, 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 below a, a landmark so everyone can know where it is. So you could, um, in fact, there's programs where they go down to Central America and teach um, the nurses um, where these points are and they're able to translate it no matter, um, no matter what um, language they're in. Um, part of the reason for that is because acupuncture, the way it was taught for you know, thousands of years before you, you go into schools and you know, have an actual education program, is being transferred from master to apprentice. And a lot of times the, the master would say, okay, this point right here, and then just kind of point to it and let the person feel it. This is what's for the, the stomach. Um, it's more difficult with population and uh, growing as well as you know just the spread of this information to have that same setup and so through finding you know going to I guess just standardizing these points they're able to uh, disperse that information to many more people um, now again depending on the system that you're looking at those points just expand um, exponentially um, in the ear alone, there's probably another uh, 100 to you know 200 points, um, and so it, it's these points are just kind of the, the basic ones, the ones on the, the major meridians. Okay, interesting, very very interesting. So this kind of um, we kind of go back to, okay, so a point on the stomach, does that really affect your, or I'm sorry, a point on your knee, does that really affect your stomach? How do we know this? Can we prove it? Um, what exactly is going on here? Um, and so you've seen, or we've seen in the last, um, call it 50 years, a lot of research um, going into what is acupuncture, how does it work, um, let's prove that this, you know, from prove from a Western model of the, like I said, the uh, double-blind uh, placebo-controlled studies, let's show that this stuff works. The problem with that is, first of all, a lot of what I'm talking about in acupuncture is intangible. I can't sit down and say, okay, here's what chi looks like. Here's, um, you know, how it behaves. Well, uh, here, you know, is some quantifiable way of, of saying that it does exist. Uh, so that, in and of itself, is kind of difficult. Um, I like to think that it uh, we will someday be able to see it and, and understand it. It's just we don't have the, the technology or the ability to look that in that direction yet. And to be honest with you, if we never get there, it's not the end of the world again because it, it does work. Now, a lot of the research studies that are out there um, use something called sham acupuncture. Uh, sham acupuncture is uh, putting needles in places that are not one of those major points. Um, it's done so that you try you try to eliminate some of the um, oh I, I guess this is how they they try to accomplish the placebo um, control. Unfortunately, um, kind of what I talked about with the Japanese style, where they they go off the meridians and find the points that are most affected. There's a lot of um, theories out there saying that sham acupuncture is not in fact a sham. You're actually getting some benefit from those needles. So you'll see a study that says, um, you know, compared to sham acupuncture, um, there is no s statistical difference um, for a real acupuncture treatment. Unfortunately, they're not comparing it to, um, they're not properly comparing the two. There, there's, 
it's very, very difficult to establish a true placebo with acupuncture just by the nature of those meridians and that whole network of, of energy splits off an infinite number of times, just like capillaries have split off from major arteries. It's impossible to put a needle in the body and not affect um, the flow within. So I guess that the bottom line is it's still in its infancy for the, the actual research, but it's getting there. We, we keep getting closer and closer. Um, as far as the, the actual theory behind it, Western theory, um, is kind of the microtrauma theory. The understanding that, um, well, first of all, uh, blood or um, trauma itself, inf the whole inflammation process, um, is really what um, creates healing. So when you put a, an acupuncture needle in a certain point, um, and this works, this model works the best for like pain, um, you're actually causing a, an inflammation response to that needle, uh, drawing more blood to the area, which in turn brings nutrients, oxygen, um, and you know various white blood cells to kind of clean things up along with that. Um, the microtrauma theory also applies to some of the accessory techniques I'll talk about in just a moment. But it's basically just the same idea that you're causing a very small trauma to initiate a healing response that then results in more healing than just, you know, for that one little um, pinprick. Um, right now, some of the most exciting research um, in acupuncture is related to um, brain imaging. Um, in the last couple of years, they've come out with a couple of studies, or actually three studies, um, through Harvard, MIT, as well as University of Michigan. Um, now, what these studies are doing is they um, are using functional um, uh, MRIs as well as uh, PET scans to um, figure out exactly how the brain is changing with acupuncture. So, for example, both a, a Harvard and a MIT study started off with the image, placed a needle um, in a, a defined point, stimulated it, and watched changes in the brain. Um, and what they found is that um, th there's significant evidence that um, the androgynous opioids sorry, um, are central to the experience of pain and acupuncture analgesia. I'm reading some quotes here from, from the studies, um, just so you know. Also, uh, MIT uh, study said that there's strong evidence that acupuncture analgesia, analgesia is uh, mediated at least in part by um, the op opioid systems. Um, excuse me for just a moment. In a nutshell, what this is talking about is that when a uh, acupuncture needle is inserted, they actually are seeing um, changes in the way the brain is firing, um, changes in how well the brain is recepting or, or receiving um, the, the natural analgesics of the body, the um, natural opioids that we produce. Um, and this is giving you know, lending weight to a couple of things. One, that acupuncture does, in fact, have a, a profound effect on the way we sense pain. But even more than that, um, they're not actually putting these needles in the brain. They're affecting change within the brain um, by using a distal point, a, a point, again, below the knee. They can actually see a change all the way up at the top, you know, in your brain. So that's kind of an area that acupuncture is really, I guess, getting some credibility in the, the medical world. Um, it's just that they're able to now start seeing the results or the changes that occur when just a simple needle with nothing in it, um, you know, is inserted into a point far away from the brain. Uh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. They can, so are they under the, the, the scan when the acupuncture needles are being in, in, inserted? Mm -hmm. Yes, hmm. they, they are running a... a my understanding of the article is um, that they're running a continuous scan, that they'll, they'll put the needle in and, uh, you know, have a, a baseline scan before that, insert the needle and do a, a manipulation. They'll, um, you know, move the needle around a little bit and then watch the results. And they are seeing definite um, uh, increased activity in areas of the brain that sense uh, and perceive pain. So would you say primarily what acupuncture does is that it, it stimulates the brain to release healing chemicals, or would you say yes, it's more? Yes, that's one way of putting it, and, and to be honest with you, that's kind of a, just a snapshot of it. Um, my theoretical basis is it's doing a lot more than that, 
but just what we've been able to um, show and to prove at this point, yes, absolutely, that's what it's doing. Um, okay. And again, that kind of goes to that intangible um, concept. Um, you know, we've never actually seen an atom. You know, we, we know, we have a pretty good understanding of exactly what it looks like or at least how it behaves, but we haven't been able to zoom in close enough to, to pick out a single atom and say, oh yeah, there it is, let's, you know, take a closer look. Um, and it's much the same way with, um, I guess, chi or, you know, the, the theories behind this. We can see the effects of them, um, but it's very difficult to see um, exactly what it is. So this is an example of how we're seeing the effect of it. Right, right. Now, um, the points, uh, they, do, you, do they, how do you locate, I mean, with your naked, uh, with the naked eye, I don't know if that's right, right <laughs> English, but how do you, is this just as a result of years of training that you can locate that pinpoint place where to insert the needle, or? Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> short answer is yes. Um, the long answer is that um, a lot of these points, it, it kind of goes back to the, the codifying or to, you know, developing a, a defined system of where these points are at. They're based on anat anatomical um, landmarks. So, you know, you'll go with the, uh, um, uh, oh, now I'm blanking on those two. Anyway, you, you'd find a, an anatomical landmark like the crease in the wrist and say that it's, um, uh, three, for lack of a better term, uh, three inches um, proximal to that is where this point is between these two tendons. Um, so there, there is a, a defined area that uh, those points are at. They're not, the points themselves are not as small as the needles. The needles are incredibly fine and small, and a lot of times the points are, are very large. Um, there's one point that a lot of people know about for headaches, um, in that webbing between your thumb and index finger. That point itself is uh, a very large point where, um, you know, you could pretty much just feel, make sure you're in the right area, put a needle in, and you're going to get an effect because that point is very large. The same one um, for that um, stomach 36. It's a very large point. Now, there are other points that you literally have to thread the needle between bones to get the desired effect. So that's a very narrow point, um, and that does take years of training and, you know, just a, a very sound understanding of anatomy and physiology to be able to, to effectively use those points. Oh, wow. Wow. Th does it have to be a specific kind of needle? Or does it have to be metal? Can it be wood? Can it be plastic? Um, yes, it can be wood and plastic. Um, it probably wouldn't be very comfortable. Uh, in, in fact, the, going back to ancient times, um, they think that the first acupuncture needles were made out of bone. Um, they've also seen um, volcanic glass, the obsidian, um, using those as needles. Um, metal is just the, the most um, effective or I guess has the least amount of pain. You're able to um, get the, the metal down small enough so it, it's not a very painful procedure but still effective. Um, and as far as like wood, um, the FDA would go nuts because you can't sterilize wood. You know, it's um, fairly difficult and I'm guessing well, any of us that have had a, a splinter don't really want an acupuncturist to say, hey, I'm going to pull out my bamboo needles and, and use those on you today. <laughs> but as far as the, the material itself, it makes some difference. Uh, some people argue that a silver-plated or gold-plated needle has different effects um, versus a, just a standard steel needle. Um, and that really gets into the finer points of um, the, the different styles of acupuncture out there. Got it. So at this point in time, why should you do acupuncture? Um, with all the different choices out there for, um, you know, health care, what makes acupuncture stand out? Um, first of all, it's effective. Um, and it's effective, and this is something I'll touch on later, in both the short term as well as lo for long term results. Um, acupuncture also is, um, acupuncture and oriental medicine for that matter, is not invasive. It's invasive to the point of you're putting a fine needle into the body, but with this I'm mostly referring to the diagnostic techniques. Um, a good example, um, well hold on for a moment, it, it's also um, very affordable um, and it's also incredibly safe. There's a reason why um, acupuncturists pay a very, very small amount um, of malpractice insurance when compared to medical doctors. And it's 
just the, in this, this case, the money doesn't lie. We're insured at such a low rate because they're not having serious or any claims at all filed against the acupuncturists. Um, now, to kind of link all four of these together, um, my favorite story is a patient with um, gastroesophageal GERD, um, reflux, acid reflux disease. Um, this patient uh, started off with heartburn and ran to the, um, the pharmacy, picked up Tums or Rolaids or, you know, your typical over-the-counter antacids, started taking those and didn't get any kind of an effect. So already they've spent, you know, a year's worth of, you know, two, three bottles a week. Hopefully it wasn't that much, but they spent quite a bit on, um, on these over-the-counter antacids. They then go into the doctor's office, uh, you know, typical Western medical doctor, um, and are prescribed uh, another, uh, I guess, higher level antacid essentially. Uh, take this for a while, don't get the effect or relief that they, they think is, you know, that they want. Um, and so the, the dose is increased or the medications changed. Um, and this goes on for, you know, a couple of years until finally the doctor says, well, we really need to make sure there's not something else going on in there. Um, so they signed them up for a gastroendoscopy, which um, for anyone that's not familiar, it's basically taking a camera and snaking it down your throat to take a look and make sure there's nothing wrong with you. Um, after this, you get the results back and the person, the patient was told, well, we don't see anything down there, let's switch your medication again. At this point, you can imagine after years of dealing with this, um, the discomfort as well as the cost for all these procedures, um, they came in and saw me. I was able to um, clear this case up in about six months so that they no longer have um, these symptoms whatsoever. Now, with all of, especially the non-invasive part, I didn't have to do any of the, the tests the doctor, you know, the, the gastroendoscopy. I was just able to ask a series of questions about um, their health at that point in time, as well as lifestyle um, questions, diagnose them, and then through acupuncture and herbs, um, treat them and have um, the treatment be over and done with, have a set time. It's not, you're going to be on this medication for the rest of your, uh, rest of your life. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I really am looking forward to the future as people start to understand um, just how effective and affordable acupuncture is um, to be able to treat the people um, initially, well, how do I put that, to be able to start um, seeing people for these everyday problems that will eventually lead to a very costly medical condition, but be able to take care of this at the beginning um, without having to go through all the, these hoops and these tests. Essentially, um, in my opinion, acupuncture is an answer to some of the health care problems that we're seeing in our country today just because of these four things that you can see up here on the screen right now. Hmm. That's, that's fascinating uh, what you were able to do for that person. So mm -hmm. you, you addressed his, um, not only the physical problem, but also his, his lifestyle problems. You want to talk about mm -hmm. that a little bit? Did, did you have to um, do also, also? How did you address that? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Did I have to? Uh, um, I, with, without without uh, uh, revealing everything you did, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I mean, it was just interesting that you you not only addressed the the pain or whatever it was, but you also addressed his mm -hmm. lifestyle factors. So, I mean, what what yes. could be some of the things that you you addressed there? In this situation, uh, the two big ones um, were diet as well as um, smoking. And so, um, and this is something we'll touch on a little bit later as far as chemical dependency, I was able to help the person quit smoking, which plays a very large role in acid reflux, or at least mm -hmm. I found it to, to play a role, um, as well as just changing their, their diet in general. Um, and that's what um, the primary ways that I go about lifestyle change is looking at um, some of the things that they're doing that lead to this condition. And, you know, Part of my training is um, in Chinese food therapy. Um, it's basically a way of turning your grocery store into an herbal pharmacy, um, but done so with food. Um, also, a, a aspect of that is looking at your underlying condition and changing the, the foods that you're eating to um, support the treatment that I'm providing at the clinic as well. Mm -hmm. So that's, in a nutshell, kind of where I go with the, the lifestyle adjustments. You know, and 
whenever I'm, I'm working with a patient, it really is a relationship. That patient, um, I'm providing everything I can as far as, you know, on the, the acupuncture and oriental medicine side to get that person better. But in a lot of ways, they also have to make that commitment to um, better health themselves. You know, if you don't want to um, get better, I can do all the acupuncture in the world. I can, you know, do acupuncture every single day, twice a day, and they're still not going to get better. So a large part of it is just them accepting and willing to, um, you know, go through the treatment and, and take responsibility for what they're doing. And that gets more into, I guess, my own personal medical philosophy, but, um, you know, that's part of what I do to address the mind, body, spirit, and, and community. Hmm. Interesting. So that actually uh, leads nicely into some of the other techniques that I do. Um, right there in the middle, you're going to see food therapy, which I, I briefly touched on, which is essentially, um, you know, what types of foods should you be eating or at least adjusting your diet so you eat more of um, in order to um, benefit your condition. Um, we also do something called moxibustion or just moxa. It's um, like a, a large uh, cigar of um, mugwort, or um, it's aya in Chinese. Um, and this works much like the needle. You use it on specific points, and um, you get the same effects to, to some extent. I was working on an older gentleman who um, had incredibly tight muscles in his neck and shoulders, um, and I've never before had a situation where I put a needle in and there was no resistance whatsoever to that needle. I moved the needle around, he couldn't feel a thing. In other words, he was just very, very deficient. Those tight muscles seemed like it was an excess, but the underlying problem was that he just didn't have enough energy there to maintain the proper state. Um, next treatment with the, the person, I used um, moxibustion because that, in my experience, is more of a tonifying. It actually builds stuff up. And using that, um, he was able to um, get a lot of relief for, for both the pain and tightness in his, his neck and shoulders. So it, Moxa is an alternative. Um, there have been um, several very concerned um, landlords um, calling up you know, the, the acupuncturists in their building saying, you know, what, um, exactly what type of herbal medicine are you practicing in there? Because Moxa actually has a very distinctive smell that reminds you of some other you know, illicit substances. Um, so sometimes people will shy away from that. New technology is out there so you can actually use a salve of essential oils um, to get the same result and, you know, just heating it up as well. Um, also, uh, oh, what was I going to say? Oh, Moxa um, uses that same idea of microtrauma. In fact, Moxa, the Gua Sha, Twina, and Cupping all four kind of revolve around that idea of you're causing a microtrauma to the area. Um, the volatile chemicals in the smoke itself are irritating to the skin. Um, they believe that there's some benefit to that as well as just heating the area up in general um, is causing a, a change in that specific location. Um, cupping is perhaps the, the most uh, well known of all the accessory or other techniques that are used. Um, some of you may remember on the Olympics the, the pictures or the, the video of the swimmers with several circular bruises going down their back. Um, or I, I believe it was either this uh, last Academy Award or, or the one previous to that. I don't know the actress's name, but someone showed up with an open back dress and you could see the same circular um, bruising on there. And that essentially is, uh, or that is caused by cupping. Um, the traditional way of doing this um, is glass jars um, using fire to create a vacuum and then affixing that to the skin. So you don't, if done right, um, the person never will get burned from it. It's a, a very, actually very pretty technique if you watch someone who's good at it doing it. Um, but they're putting these cups over large muscle masses to draw blood up through the tissue, um, again resulting in the, the healing. Um, cupping can also be used um, for feet fever reduction as well as um, for asthma are the two other really big uses for it. And there's actually entire, um, uh, there's entire, uh, uh, I guess, specific practices focused just on cupping and it can be used for many, many other conditions. I'm just not as familiar with them. Um, gua Sha 
is in this picture is a little hard to see, but that person is actually taking a plastic um, device and scraping it along the skin. Um, this is very similar to, I believe it's called the Graston technique. It's the one that chiropractors have started to use, where they use metal instruments to scrape it along the skin, and this is uh, very good for uh, muscle pain. Um, I've had experience with all of these, and I promise you they all work, and they work beautifully. Um, Gua sha isn't used as often, um, but it's, it, well, it's not used as often because it can be more painful than the others, and patients are not as tolerant of it, um, but again, it's, it's very effective. Um, and then finally, it's a technique called Tui Na, um, and Tui Na is essentially the massage therapy of um, Chinese medicine. Um, it's also very close to Shiatsu, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, but essentially it's um, massage therapy that uses acupressure points along with the treatment. So you're doing a very uh, defined protocol to treat a joint or an area that's injured. Um, and part of that protocol is pressing on the associated um, acupuncture points. Now I'm going to briefly talk about herbs. Um, herbs are just absolutely amazing um, in their potential. Um, I could treat a patient with herbs alone and see outstanding results. Um, in the United States, acupuncture is a primary focus um, with herbs as kind of being thought of as a secondary. Um, the truth is over in China, um, the herbalists are considered to be the physicians, whereas the acupuncturists are basically the technicians. Um, so it would be like the equivalent of seeing a doctor versus um, seeing a, um, a rehab, uh, a physical therapist. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of potential for growth with herbs. Um, one of the thing that, things that, that is holding us back right now is uh, regulation difficulties. Um, and essentially what that is is that the FDA um, doesn't regulate um, herbal supplements and herbs fall under that. So you can, you know, anybody can say, oh yeah, this is a, a Chinese herbal formula that will treat this or whatever various ailment it is, but there's really no backing to say, yes, this in fact works um, or, you know, that this is um, uh, manufactured under uh, good practice. Well, I guess they do have GMP stuff, but anyway, that aside, um, there's hundreds of formulas. Um, I'm familiar with um, over 400 formulas, um, what they're used for, um, very specific uh, conditions. For example, just for colds and flus, there's probably a, about 40 different major formulas, and all those formulas can be modified to the individual um, in the condition that they're presenting with. For example, um, if you're getting a, a cold, well, is that cold um, with a lot of sinus congestion? Is it primarily um, coughing? Is it with a sore throat? Um, these are some questions that we can ask to take this one general formula and modify it to be even more effective. Now, when that's done, there are no side effects. Um, a lot of times, people will go into the acupuncturist and get a, a bottle of uh, tea pills or you know just some pre-prepared formula. Um, that does have a, a bit of a risk of side effects just because it isn't tailored specifically to that patient, and so. You know, uh, practitioners need to be aware of some of the, the conditions that it can cause or um, ways to, um, I guess, fix that through the, acu or through the acupuncture um, in, in addition to the herbs. Um, and then the other nice thing is that the herbs are, um, they're natural. You know, it, it's not, um, an example, a good example of this is Ma Wang or Ephedra. Um, Ma Wang in Chinese medicine is used uh, primarily for uh, colds or flus. Um, it is used in a very specific um, circumstance and pretty much nowhere else. Now, if you take Ma Wong and alter the chemical, um, the, the chemicals extract stuff from it, you end up with uh, Sudafed or Ephedrine, which um, you know causes some side effects. It it can make you a little hyper. It dries things out. Still, you know, it, it's not in its natural form. And if you take that one step further, um, the reason why, at least in Minnesota, we cannot buy um, products containing uh, Sudafed in the, the store without a, a 
license or an ID is because of the, the meth concern. So it shows that if you take something from its natural state and continue to distill it down and change its chemical formulas, we see in a lot of the, the drugs out there, um, you run into even more side effects. You run into even more problems that can be associated with that uh, chemical itself. Um, and the whole herbal discussion is something that um, I could spend another webinar on. And I'm going to try to just speed things up. I looked at the time. It looks like we're coming up on or a little over an hour of this. So um, now going on to the, the specific applications of acupuncture. Um, neurological rehabilitation is uh, huge. As we kind of talked about before, um, it, acupuncture itself can affect the way the brain is actually firing and, and working. Um, I uh, did a, a clinical shift at the Courage Center um, in Minnesota, and the Courage Center specializes in strokes, traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries um, for just their inpatient program. In fact, it's a wonderful organization that services uh, or uh, provides services for uh, thousands of people in the, the greater metro area. Um, in their inpatient setting, we saw um, wonderful results with um, being able to regain some of the functionality of um, limbs as well as um, just helping with the uh, um, additional symptoms associated with these conditions. Um, we were able to get these results through just plain acupuncture, you know, a, a straight um, typical diagnosis and the uh, application of the, the needles in the correct points. Um, we also did something called electroacupuncture, which is hooking up um, a mild electrical current to certain needles. And then scalp acupuncture is um, what I talked about before with the, the Parkinson's patient that I'm seeing. Um, scalp acupuncture, as you can see on this side here, is this is one method of acu or scalp acupuncture. Um, you're actually selecting points based on the, the location of the body or what it specifically does and putting a series of needles in a, a line or in a specific area. Um, and this, has, um, this results in just amazing... I mean, almost miraculous things where somebody who for four years hadn't been able to, to use um, their arm is now able to regain 70% functionality. Um, it's not very well understood as far as how this works in the, the Western medical sense, but it does have um, some connections to that. Well, what um, do you mean he, is, he has not been able to use his arm? You mean total um, paralysis or was it like it, a brain injury? What was it? And see, I'm, this case study came from um, a book that was translated from Chinese into English. It was actually um, written by the, the gentleman that developed um, scalp acupuncture. And it wasn't clear if it was, um, a, there was complete um, paralysis, nerve paralysis, or if it was partial and just atrophied over time. Um, so unfortunately, I can't tell you for sure, you know, was that nerve actually severed? Was it completely dead and damaged? And it, you know, very miraculously would have brought it back, or if it was a combination of, of these items. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to spend, I spent um, about four months um, at the Courage Center and able to see results where people were able to start moving their, their hands once again or their fingers um, or get feeling back. Um, but I wasn't able to follow that patient through, you know, a year or, or two of, of treatment in order to, to see this. Okay. Um, I will say with the gentleman that I'm working with with Parkinson's, um, after just three treatments, has noticed um, times when he actually does is asymptomatic. Um, before he, you know, would not go a, a single, you know, stretch of time with being asymptomatic, and now he's able to come back and say, "Hey, Rob, I I was able to go for two hours after this treatment and not have any symptoms whatsoever." Wow. So this. Unfortunately, the, the area, the research in this is, is still kind of out there, and a lot of people are hesitant to try it, thinking, hey, when it comes to neurological damage, there's not much you can do. You're kind of stuck there. Um, from what I've seen clinically, as well as you know, reading um, some of the case studies and other literature out there, that's not true. There, there is hope. There are, are effective treatments to um, help people recover from this. Um, another thing I'll say really quick about the the time I spent at the Courage Center, is we were able to help these people or these patients with much more than just um, what they were experiencing from their, their injury or um, you know, their primary diagnosis. Um, a great example is a gentleman who, this was an inpatient program, 
he wasn't able to see a, a dentist um, for two weeks um, out from when he told me, you know, they initially scheduled it, um, but was having severe uh, tooth pain. Um, I was able to, um, after one treatment, make it so this gentleman no longer had that tooth pain and was able to make it all the way to his dental appointment. So when you're in the situation where you're not very mobile um, and having a lot of secondary um, conditions associated with your you know, primary diagnosis, this is, you know, it's phenomenal to be able to, to help that person um, get through not just why they're there in the first place, but the other things that kind of come up and seem to impede the whole healing process itself. I see. And the curb center, what, what, is this a center that is focused primarily on acupuncture? No, not at all. In fact, this was one of the, um, um, just a, a, an amazing partnership that um, they formed with our school for our clinical program. Um, Courage Center is, um, uh, it, it, it's dedicated or it focused on the neurological rehabilitation. They work with both inpatient and outpatient groups and it wasn't until, and they've been around for I'm guessing 30 plus years. Um, it wasn't until just a couple of years ago that um, I don't know who approached who, but they um, decided to implement a program using acupuncture with their inpatient program at, to see what kind of results we could get. Hmm. So it, it truly was a clinical experience that was um, one of a kind um, and taught me so much about um, the, the true power of acupuncture. Again, going in there and you're seeing somebody who just had a stroke and is you know, paralyzed on their left side and they're able to um, you know, start regaining some of the, the movement in their, their fingers. Um, and again, yes, I, I understand that this was an integrated system and that there were a lot of other treatments going on, whether it was physical therapy or occupational therapy or the, the other medical treatments that were going on, but acupuncture, in my opinion, played a, a huge role in, in their recovery as well. We would see patients they could, everyone could either opt in or opt out of acupuncture, and it was provided at no cost. Um, and we saw patients who would make wonderful um, uh, leaps forward with the, their treatment, and then for some reason or other decided not to continue, and they would kind of go back to, um, not go back, but not progress as quickly. Or the converse of patients who at first said, no, there's no way I'm going to try that acupuncture stuff, it doesn't work, um, just kind of hit a wall and finally say, out of almost desperation, I'm going to give this a try, um, and started seeing amazing results. Well, I, I have a comment from one of our viewers saying mm -hmm. a, friend, a friend could not raise her arms above her head, and acupuncture helped her raise her, her arms. Mm -hmm. I, too, have had tremendous results from acupuncture. Yeah, and it's, I, I keep coming back to how amazing it is for as, as simple as it is. Um, now, in this case, I am talking strictly acupuncture because we weren't able to prescribe herbs in, in that setting, um, in large part due to the number of medications they were taking. But just taking a, a single small needle um, and knowing what points to use them on and getting so much change just from that, it, it really just demonstrates the power of this medicine. How long do those needles stay in there on average? Um, it depends on the condition. Um, on average, I'd say it's 20 to 30 minutes of needle retention. There's some times that you'd want to keep it in for longer, uh, depending on what their underlying condition is. And there's other times that you um, just put them in, keep them in for just a little bit, and, and pull them out. Um, one of the techniques I didn't talk about with uh, um, the neurological rehabilitation um, is getting uh, uh, nerve ticks. So in other words, um, I would thread a, a needle through the ankle until I got deep into one of the nerves, touch the nerve with the needle and get them to actually tick or to um, have an involuntary response to that and flex their, their foot or their ankle. Um, and in that case, you're, you just get three quick ticks and you pull the needle out right away because just sitting there next to the nerve is going to most likely do more damage than good. Mm. So it, it very much depends on the condition that the person has. Okay. I have another comment from one of our viewers saying he, he speaking about you, is doing a terrific job presenting a great deal of information in a great <laughs> to understand way. Well, I, I do greatly appreciate that. Um, the, one of the 
biggest obstacles to overcome with this presentation is how do I condense three years of school uh, and all my clinical experience into something that actually makes sense to a person that's never heard about acupuncture before. So I truly thank the person that, that said that and I, I appreciate that, the comment. Well, 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 I agree with her. So he, Keep going. You're doing great. And please don't feel feel like you have to rush or anything. It's, I mean, the, the most important is, thing is to is to get the information out to people and don't worry about well, thank it. Thank you. Okay. The good good news is I only have a few more slides left. So um, then you know I I love to answer questions and I'm willing to sit here and answer as many as you guys have. Okay. Um, right. So going into another application um, of acupuncture is chemical dependency. Um, again, I, another one of my um, clinical shifts, and now this is spilled into my, my practice as well, is um, working with people who were uh, heroin addicts, alcoholics, um, uh, smokers, um, all of these, um, and then other addictions that I have not seen yet, um, are very successfully treated with acupuncture. Um, I take a, a kind of a holistic approach. I look at, um, and this, this psychological doesn't refer to the fact that I'm a, a psychotherapist, it, it's more of the, um, the mind and spirit connection that acupuncture inherently has. Um, when I treat somebody for chemical dependency, I'm treating both the physical symptoms of withdrawal as well as the psychological symptoms that are associated with that. How do you um, not only help the body heal but help the mind heal? Um, incidentally, acupuncture I, and oriental medicine is amazing because it makes no distinction between the physical and the emotional. Um, both are equally important in my diagnosis as well as my, my treatment. And so that's one reason I think that um, this style of medicine excels in the chemical dependency is because I don't care if um, you're having mostly psychological withdrawal or, you're have, or psychological dependence or mostly physical dependence it's all kind of blended together into one treatment. Now, chemical dependency is primarily treated using, it's called the NADA protocol, or um, it, it's a form of regular acupuncture. And you can see on the left, um, those points um, that are in green are the five points that they have found are very effective for treating just about every, any kind of addiction. Um, there's both a, a Western as well as a, um, I guess, Oriental basis for using these points. Um, but the, the upside or the, the nice part about NADA is you can get a group of you know, 50 people in a room and have um, somebody with relatively little training um, put these five needles in and move on to the next person very quickly. So you can you know, literally go into a, um, a chemical dependency group setting and treat many, many people um, and have the spectacular results. Um, one of my instructors in school actually um, helped develop the NADA protocol and she was having a problem with her needles being stolen um, and finally figured out you know, who was doing it and asked them, why are you stealing my needles? And the guy said, I, I, just, I, I brought them home, I, I cut them up and I, I boiled them. I, I just wanted to get whatever that, that stuff in the needles is. You know, that, that stuff just makes me feel so good. It, it's you know, better than the drugs I was taking. Um, and in truth, there's nothing in those needles. Um, it was just purely the effect of the needles and what they were doing for them, both physically and psychologically. Um, so I guess that kind of speaks to the, the power of this. Um, also, not a protocol has been used um, for um, the people that survived um, World Trade Center um, uh, for uh, hur Hurricane Katrina. Um, it works, again, on that psychological level as well. So it, it really is a, an amazing uh, protocol. Um, it, it's something that is, a, again, effective and very, very cheap. Um, now when I, um, in my uh, private practice, treat someone with chemical dependency, I also include herbs. Um, the acupuncture is great. It gives you kind of a boost with those herbs. That treatment effect is able to be continued from um, between the sessions, between what I'm seeing that person and that provides the, the most stability throughout the, the treatment session. Um, at my clinic I just um, institute a, a, a smoking cessation program uh, and it's essentially a, a six-week program where you're getting 12 acupuncture treatments and herbs 
um, and I've been very successful so far in getting people to quit smoking. Uh, let's see. That also kind of leads into mental health. Um, one of my areas of interest is the application of, of acupuncture for in a mental health setting. Um, it's very, very effective when you're complementing other um, treatment methods that are out there, or the uh, cognitive therapy, the different psychotherapies, as well as medication. Um, the beauty about acupuncture is that it works immediately and it has lasting results. Um, so for example, um, it has that immediate effect as if, like Valium. You take Valium and it's, you know, it calms you down, you're, you know, in a better mental state, um, but then it wears off and you have to take another one later on. Um, the converse is um, an antidepressant. Um, you, you go on to an antidepressant and you're told by the doctor, oh, this is going to take four to six weeks before it works, but it's going to work and it's going to have lasting results. Acupuncture kind of threads the, the needle and, and um, or I guess splits the difference and works in both ways. It, I've had a patient come in sobbing just, you know, in a, a horrible mental state and by the time that person leaves the, the treatment room is calm and smiling. Um, and then with um, continuous treatment, that effect is lasting and, you know, it, it, they don't go back to the, the state they were in. Um, Right now, probably the, the best area of, um, or the, the most promising area of, of the mental health application of Chinese medicine or oriental medicine um, is in the work with our troops returning um, from the Middle East. Uh, the, the Pentagon, it's kind of strange for a lot of acupuncturists to think that the, the military um, in the country is actually leading the way with research um, into post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and the use of ac acupuncture, um, but they they're doing a lot of, of of looking into the effectiveness as well as um, you know how can this actually be applied. Uh, back in 2007, um, Michael um, Hollifield, uh, along with a few other researchers, um, were able to do a study where they um, assigned um, 73 patients to one of three conditions: either um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, acupuncture or they did a control wait list. So basically we're still going to offer you treatment but you're going to have to hold off on that for just a, a little bit. Um, they did 12 weeks of treatment and what they found is that acupuncture by itself was similar to the cognitive kind of behavioral therapy as far as effect on uh, depression, anxiety and just general impairment and that both of them were significant improvements over the control wait list. Um, taking the study a step further, um, in Fort Bliss, Texas, they actually, uh, again, back in 2007 after the study came out, um, implemented a, um, a program, an integrative approach to um, PTSD that not only took into account or not only used acupuncture but also biofeedback, yoga, um, traditional um, psychotherapy as well as medication. Um, and it was so successful that um, they now have, there's now 16 different um, post-traumatic stress disorder programs across the country that are um, using acupuncture in conjunction with other treatments to um, get our, our troops better. Um, and as you guys may or might not know, post-traumatic stress disorder is not just something that soldiers returning home have. You know, it, it can be the result of, of any um, severe uh, psychological or physical trauma that people experience. Um, and plus, post-traumatic stress disorder has a lot of the same components of just um, of mental health uh, conditions such as depression or anxiety. So if it's working with one of the most severe mental health conditions out there, the potential is just huge for how it can be implemented with other um, mental health programs. In fact, um, Rosa uh, Schneider um, just came out with a, a study um, showing a significant reduce a uh, significant reduction in um, symptoms for pregnant women with major depression. Now, when you're pregnant, you don't necessarily want to start taking all these medications. Acupuncture can give you that significant um, reduction in symptoms um, without the, the side effects or um, uh, danger to the, the unborn baby.
And then finally, just to kind of show the extreme gamut of this, um, acupuncture is being used a lot for, um, it's called facelift acupuncture, or rejuvenation acupuncture. Um, basically, it's, um, you know, guys and girls who go in and say, you know, I, I just am not looking the, the greatest, I have these wrinkles here, um, what can you do for me? Um, what's wonderful about this is not only is it affecting the specific area, but they're using this to um, change the entire constitution, the, their entire body to um, just, you know, become healthier in general. Um, I don't know very much about facelift acupuncture except for just the very basics of the theory behind it and how it's used. Um, but I wanted to kind of include this to let you know that um, it works on everything from, you know, troops returning home with severe um, uh, mental illness to um, just your, you know, average everyday person that wants to look better. Um, and finally, I'm just going to end on this screen. This is just the beginning list of conditions that are effectively treated with acupuncture. And again, um, if someone from the, the FDA is listening and you know saying, "Oh, you can't claim that it treats it," layman's terms, this is what um, some, the the beginning of the list of what acupuncture can treat. Wow! And with that, um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Okay, excellent. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been this has been very, very, very informative, and I, I appreciate you you doing this, especially being your, your very, very first webinar. You did great. Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, we certainly have to have you come back for for more because this is. I, mean, I think I think you've just scratched the surface on this, and I think. Oh yes. A lot to learn from this. You could probably so, take any one of these slides and do an entire hour on each one. Oh, really? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, that would I'd probably just be scratching the surface with them as well. Really? Mm-hmm. My goodness. Oh, there's so much we don't know. So much we don't know. And, and um, you did say this can be, um, acupuncture can be used even for postpartum depression? Um, postpartum as well as um, major, the, the study itself was major depression during pregnancy. So the, the women in the study um, were diagnosed with a major depressive episode um, while they were pregnant. But yes, postpartum depression, um, that, the whole um, field of women's health is an area that acupuncture is just amazing at, at treating. Um, I know you had mentioned at the very beginning something relating to hormones. Um, truly, I am not concerned with you know how acupuncture is directly affecting the hormones within the body. I just know that the results um, you, I see better results with controlling like the symptoms symptoms of menopause or um, PMS with acupuncture than people get with hormone replacement therapies. Wow! Wow! Okay. <laughs> Interesting. I think we should we should have a we should have a a, a contest here, Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> because of course there are the diehard people who believe in hormone hormone therapy. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's and now one thing that I I didn't mention throughout all of this is I am a firm believer that it, you can't just take one approach to your health. You need to take into account all the different things that are out there, and mm -hmm. then you know, integrate them into something that makes sense to you, um, and it's through that integration that you achieve the, the greatest amount of healing. Um, I know, like, progesterone creams um, are very effective as well, um, and, you know, if my patients are interested in that, I can point them in the right direction to learn more about it. I'm not an expert and, and can't, you know, say one way or another, um, you know, recommend that to them, I guess, um, but I do know, um, from what I understand of them, that they are very effective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, matter of fact, fact Jack, oh, I'm sorry, Jackie. Sorry. Jackie will be speaking about it next week, and she has had okay. some amazing results with pro mm -hmm. uh, progesterone. Okay. Um, well, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say it's the same thing with um, uh, the mental health. I would love to see um, more studies done on um, you know taking three groups of, or four groups of people, um, one experiencing just straight uh, uh, psycho, uh, psychotherapy um, and other just the medications and other acupuncture and then comparing them to a fourth group that's receiving all three of those. And I think that you would see significant results when you combine all three of those treatments um, as opposed to just doing them individually.
And I, I think that the same can be said for just about any um, treatment that's out there or any condition that's out there. David, did we lose you? Are you still there, Rob? So, uh, I'm, I'm here. Still, I'm yes. here. I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I was, I was talking. I didn't, didn't realize I was muted. So I apologize. Okay. Uh, folks, go ahead and type in your questions. And uh, Sharon and I will be fielding them as well. We'll be um, saying them out as, as Robert fields them. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to show you. Uh, let's take, this, take the, the controls really quickly uh, for a brief moment for a, a brief infomercial. Sorry about that. We, we got to do this. Um, just to let you know a, more, a little bit more about us and what we do. And Sherry, if you would just uh, get prepared to start asking those questions. This is the, our website, and this is the, the, our home page, and there you see Building Strength, uh, Spirit, Mind, Body. And as Robert has been talking about, there has to be a, uh, you've got to approach health from several different perspectives and not just one. And thank you, Robert, Robert for bringing that out. Uh, the, the upcoming webinars, um, we have this tonight. So really what you can do, folks, is that uh, after the presentation, you can just go to, go to our site and if your questions haven't been uh, as treated or you, you, you feel you need to know more, you can actually go to our site and type in your name and, and then just put in your comment or your question. And of course, I'm sure Robert would like to hear, get some feedback from you as to what you thought about it and what areas you would like him to concentrate on for his next presentation. So go ahead and, and, uh, and go to our website and type in your questions and comments there. The upcoming webinars, you can easily just, the same way, just click on the banner and you can register for them. Same thing with Jackie, and she's been, she'll be talking about prostate cancer, um, sorry, breast cancer prevention. So we've got quite a few coming up and you can look on the right hand side, you can see the other webinars coming up. Or you can go to our calendar portion, and you can see the, the webinars that are coming up on our calendar. This, this is a little slow coming up, but you can see. Usually, uh, by this time, the whole, this whole center is filled up, so we're still getting more and more uh, 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 requests to do webinars, so we'll be filling the rest of them in. If you would like to catch up on past webinars, if, if, you, if you feel, oh, if you, if you think uh, these are things that you would like to play a part in, uh, there's a membership where you can pay just a, a minimal fee each month or you can get a, an even larger discount by paying for the six months or for paying for a year where you have unlimited access to everything we've had we've done in the past two and a half years. That's close to going on 200 webinars, long um, one and a half hour webinars at, the, at least that you can just get into and really, really educate yourself on. Or you can buy, you can buy a gift. Thanksgiving and Christmas are coming up anyway. Buy, buy, buy membership gifts and give them out to your friends and family because I tell you, the information that we are putting together on this site, some of them have never been created before. They have just been created because we asked the presenters to put them up, um, to do them for us. So, uh, and, and the key, oops, excuse me, it's a loud noise. Why people have to make their motorcycles so loud, <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. Uh, the, as I was trying to say, folks, the key is that we are creating these webinars for the lay person primarily. Now, of course, we have several different healthcare professionals involved and who, are, who, who joined, like tonight, there were a couple of them who joined and to listen to Robert. But the key is to make it as simple and straightforward as possible because in the final analysis is the person who is in charge of his or her own health. And the more she understands, how her mind and her body works, the better she'll be able to um, to to cooperate or to work with a healthcare provider. And so that's our goal, like I said at the beginning, and hopefully you can join us in this quest to to bring this this knowledge to the world. And with that said, I'm gonna get give to give this back to Robert. Robert, do you have a slide you want to put up while we're asking questions or should uh, um I don't have a particular slide that you know is going to be better than the others. Okay, let's just the introduction. Let, let, let just leave your face up. How about that? <laughs> okay. I love it. Okay, um, Sherry, go ahead. Okay, first question it says: I am allergic to any metals except gold. Do you have any recommendations? Um, 
there are um, gold-plated needles out there. They, there are needles that are covered in 24 karat gold. So I would um, recommend um, going in, you know, talking to an acupuncturist and seeing if they can obtain these needles for you. Um, the other thing, uh, you don't have to uh, use needles to get the benefit of, of this medicine. Um, there are those other techniques I was talking about, um, as well as the, the herbal um, formulas. And so there's um, a lot of times that I'll see patients that are needle phobic. Um, it's like, oh, just you know, don't don't put any needles in me. And so I'll I'll work with them with, with other techniques. Um, so those are the the two things that I would su suggest. Um, also, just in case, because it, the needles are gold plated and not just solid gold, um, I I would have the the uh, when that acupuncturist gets those needles in, um, have them do a test. Um, I wouldn't you know load you up with you know. 10 to 20 needles and, and hope that you don't react to them. Um, mm -hmm. Just like you, you know, with the new detergent, you know, spot check fabric, do a spot check with the, the needle as well. Okay. Well, how would you, what would you, this is actually my question. Uh, if somebody has never done it before, like myself, do you have recommendations on if you start looking in your area for ac acupuncturists, how, you know, things to look for when you're choosing one? Um, I think more importantly than anything else is that personal personal connection you're going to make with them. Um, well, I take that back. Um, making sure stuff that I talked about as far as safety, um, making sure that they have the, the correct certifications, uh, the correct training that their certification is current, as well as just asking them about what technique do you use and you know are you going to be um, in the safest possible environment. And then after that, um, you know, it, it's very important that you develop a relationship with your acupuncturist. Um, the clinic that I'm at right now, um, I, I do um, complimentary or free consultations. Um, and that is primarily so that the person comes in and can feel comfortable with me knowing, you know, uh, learning more about acupuncture as well as just learning about myself before they, you know, go into the, the full treatment. So those are the two recommendations I would make and just, you know, talking to them and, and seeing if they kind of connect with you. Okay. Well, that, that sort of leads into another question. Somebody said, uh, would you explain what a person new to acupuncture can expect at his or her initial visit? Um, no, I, I can answer this question based on the, the traditional Chinese medicine diagnosis, um, which is you can expect some strange questions and to do a few strange things. Um, <laughs> the strange questions are going to be about um, things that most of the time you're not going to hear in a healthcare setting. For example, I ask you, um, are you dreaming at night? Um, are those dreams very vivid? Are they, um, do they have an emotional uh, uh, connection when you wake up in the morning? Or do you have a, an emotional connection to them in the morning? Um, questions like that. Um, and then um, most acupuncturists are going to take a look at your tongue, which um, seems to a lot of people very strange. The only time a doctor looks at their tongue is when they want to get past it and you know take a look at the tonsils back there. Um, but the tongue is very important for me anyway to do a, a proper diagnosis. It paints a picture of of what's happening um, with you know all those internal organs. Um, that's something I, I didn't touch on very much, but um, in tongue diagnosis, there's each section of the tongue is uh, corresponds to an internal organ, and based on what we're seeing there for the the size and shape of the body, the color, even the fur on the tongue, um, we're able to paint a better picture and understand what that um, is like uh, or what your your pattern of disharmony is. Um, and then the other thing I'd recommend when you go in and, and see an acupuncture acupuncturist is just wear um, loose clothing. Um, the style that I practice, I generally don't do points above the knees or above the elbows, um, but it, it's difficult, especially in Minnesota, when you get someone to come in and all they have on is a, a sweatshirt. And it's like, you know, I really would like to get a point right below your elbow, and that's going to be impossible to do with what you're wearing that day. Or, you know, even uh, tight pants, you know, something that the acupuncturist can roll up and, and get to those great points that are just below the knee. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Good. Another question: Wondering if you'd helped a patient or heard of um, a patient being helped with? I think it's the word is discoid, but lupus. Discoid lupus. Um, I have not heard of that, or you know, even you know, read. I I haven't personally done it. I also haven't read any case studies on that, or or know much about it. Um, 
this kind of touches on a, uh, an interesting thing that I, I run into a lot, and that's people will come in with a Western diagnosis. You know, they'll come and say, I have hypothyroidism. Um, so what can you do for me? And really, I, I don't diagnose and I don't form treatment plans based on that Western diagnosis. I still have to go through my entire um, diagnostic process, asking those questions, looking at the tongue. And then for, um, for example, hypothyroidism, I actually would come up with a um, well, a very common condition would be uh, spleen chi deficiency with dampness. And then from that diagnosis, I'd be able to treat with my um, medical model. Um, so I, it, in that situation, I would recommend going in and talking to an acupuncturist. They're probably going to come up with a diagnosis that you've not heard of before. Um, but in many ways, um, or most likely that acupuncturist would be successful in, in treating, at the very least, symptoms associated with it, if not, um, you know, balancing the body to heal that condition. Mm, okay. Uh, a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. the next one is, are there heart problems such as arrhythmia that may be chronic and require continuing unending acupuncture equivalent to drug dependence and side effects? Ah, yes, that's a very common question. Um, there, there are two ways that I, I go about answering this. The first is that um, if I'm doing my job right, I don't want to see you anymore. I want you to come in, get better, and then leave and come back to say hi every once in a while and, and do a, a tune-up treatment. Now, I will say I've, I've seen people who um, come in for knee pain and go through the, the questioning and figure out that, oh, um, you're a runner. You are training for marathons all the time. Um, so you're going to, um, you know, that knee pain is going to be there. In fact, could I get control back of the, the PowerPoint? Would that be okay? Yes. David, are you going to do that? Sure, sure. Hey, just watch for the okay. thing. Just, I'm going to go back to one of the previous slides. Um, what it is is that you constantly go through, here we go, um, what would happen in a situation is if you're constantly exposing yourself to the same trauma, stress, lifestyle, all of those things, yes, acupuncture is going to help, but every time you get back up to the, the top of that um, cycle here, you're re-exposed to it, and so you, you would need to keep coming in because you keep unbalancing yourself, so we need to fight against that unbalance, if, if that makes any sense at all. And that's um, where a lot of times the lifestyle um, stuff comes into into play. Now, short-term control of it, yes, absolutely, acupuncture will help with um, the short-term stuff, but it, it, if you're continuously exposed to those things that are unbalancing your body, you're going to continuously need treatment. So a lot of times with the case of the runners, and I'll say, look, I can help get rid of the pain, but in order for your body to really heal itself, you're going to have to stop running for a bit. Um, and a lot of times, if you guys know people who train for marathons, that's really tough for them to do. Um, now, when you start getting into um, conditions, um, what I would consider very deep or even a, a physical, um, uh, something wrong physically with the body, acupuncture has a more difficult time dealing with it. Um, I have the, I'm fortunate enough to work with a chiropractor um, and so if somebody comes in and says, you know, I'm having really bad uh, back pain, it's due to a herniated disc. Well, through my treatments, I can control that pain. I can and reduce that pain. But the acupuncture itself isn't going to put that disc back into place. That's when you would seek care from a chiropractor or, you know, worst case scenario, you would have, you know, a spinal surgery for that. So acupuncture does have its limitations, um, and that's also part of why I do that, that consultation is because I want people to know up front that there are certain things that, yes, acupuncture can control the symptoms of, but it's not going to completely 100% get rid of the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. This next last question has to do with addiction, and it says, mm -hmm. would short-term application of acupuncture have long-time effects on addiction or just for with the withdrawal stage? Um, it's, let's see. It, it, yeah, it's a, kind of a tricky question. Um, it would have, it primarily works through the withdrawal stage. After that, 
that's when the the person's desire or you know their I guess the this more of the psychological aspects of, of addiction come into play. Um, if you get continuous treatments, yes, that's going to help. But it, it really, in order to, to overcome a substance dependency like that, it, it has to be a commitment even before you come in. Um, for example, I will never treat someone for smoking cessation on the first day that they come in and see me. Um, they might say, yes, let's get started right now. Let's go. Let's do it. I want them to go home and, and really kind of analyze um, how they're going to do it, you know, get into the right frame of mind. So acupuncture, I guess in that case, um, is going to be more successful for just kind of um, with the initial withdrawal, the psychological and the, the physical aspects of that. Um, and then after that, it, it's up to the person to make that choice to no longer engage in that behavior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I can see that's where the connection or the relationship you would develop with your ac acupuncturist would be important too as you're trying to make Absolutely. those lifestyle changes to be able to discuss those things. Yes. Well, it looks like those are all of the questions. Okay. Uh, I, I, I actually have one that came in through through the email. Someone actually went to put a, put a note, I guess, <laughs> on the comment section. I guess you didn't realize that she could do it here, but here's the question. I'd like to ask Robert what kind of success he has had working with obesity and uh, eating disorders. Um, now, when I hear eating disorders, I, the um, my psych psychology kind of kicks in, and I'm thinking of the the textbook ones of like anorexia, um, bulimia, those sort of things. I have not personally treated any of those. Um, now, as far as obesity, um, it is very, very much like um, smoking cessation or chemical dependency um, in that it is, I, I can help you, um, I can help the body um, or help, you know, I guess balance everything so you're running at maximum efficiency as far as, um, you know, your digestive system and just being able to, to process things. After that, if, you know, you're eating, you know, a, a Big Mac every single day for lunch, you know, that comes down to the personal choice. You know, I, I can only do so much as far as uh, working with obesity. Um, now, there are cases, again, going back to the hypothyroidism, where um, they are doing everything they need to, and they're still not losing the weight, or, you know, a lot of cases with water retention. Um, in those cases, acupuncture is incredibly effective because they already have the um, lifestyle in place where, you know, they're not going to continue to uh, going back to you know, this, they're not going to continue to put the, the stress, the lifestyle stress on their life. Um, and so acupuncture can kick in and correct that balance. So obesity, um, if it's based more in lifestyle than uh, medical, um, is uh, the success rate completely depends on the person. Right, right. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay, that covers it. Show you. Did any more come in? Any more questions? I haven't seen any any more questions at all. Okay. Okay. Well, excellent. This is good. I see more of my own. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had quite a few people say things like, uh, oh, "What well, great, fabulous presentation! Thank you for this introduction. Thank you. This was very informative," and on and on and on. So, thank you. Thank you. This well, Thank you, everyone who was listening tonight. I, I truly enjoy um, sharing, you know, my passion with you guys. Absolutely, and thank you. And we certainly would love to have you come come back uh, sometime soon. So we we will be in touch. All right, sounds great. Thank great. you, Rob. You're welcome. You guys have a great night. Hey, you too. Thanks. Well, folks, that ends it for tonight, and uh, you have a great evening. Be sure to join us again for tomorrow with. Dr. Stan Gross on the Seeds of Immortality. Isn't that an interesting <laughs> title? Okay, so be sure you be sure to join us. So have a great evening and God bless. <laughs>